I one time heard some folks talking about podcasting specifically, and they were talking about how in podcasting, impact is more important or greater than what they called imprint, right? What they meant by that was that you're better off as a podcaster having, you know, a hundred people who listen to your podcast regularly and you know, who you can really influence and drive toward uh, things and, and get them to do things than having a million people who listen to your podcast, but don't do anything as a result of it or don't, you know, it doesn't really have any impact on them. So, um, he said he measures, you know, the effect of a podcast, not by imprint, but by impact. And if we were to apply that same kind of principle to communication, you would be hard pressed to find anything that would have a greater impact on communication than culture. Um, you know, pound for pound culture has probably more impact on communication than any other uh, factor as far as I'm concerned. And so I want to talk a little bit in this video about about that. What is it about culture that impacts communication? What are the different ways in which culture influ influences and impacts communication? And, uh, and to do that, we're really going to focus on um, a few of what are called the dimensions of culture. And uh, the dimensions of culture really uh, were uh, kind of uh, the, the godfather of, of the dimensions of culture. This kind of discussion really is, is named, it was Geert Hofstede is his name. Uh, and you see the gentleman here, Geert Hofstede, came up with some what he called dimensions of culture. And and not all of these were part of Hofstede's dimensions, but a lot of them are. These are significantly influenced by Hofstede's um, dimensions of culture. Um, so we're going to take a look at each of these different types of ways that culture influences communication and uh, and and affects our perspective on things. And, and as such, again, then influences the way that we communicate with one another, especially interculturally. So the first one we're going to look at is individualism versus collectivism. This is essentially like the me versus we attitude in a sense, um, the, the me versus we. In an individualistic culture, the priority is the individual. The individual is themselves the priority. We put ourselves above a kind of everything else. And we, we go for what we want, what we need. So we're very direct in that. We're very uh, kind of self-centered. And I say that not in a negative way necessarily. There's room for both. But as in a collectivistic culture, you're much more concerned with not upsetting the fruit basket, so to speak, right? You're much more concerned with how is this going to impact the vibe of the entire group, for example. And, and so um, there are very different approaches and very different um, uh, ideas and thoughts on that. But, uh, but we get the kind of this me versus we attitude, which one is more important? Is the me more important than the we or vice versa? And we can see if we look at a map of kind of individualistic versus collectivistic cultures. And here we see um, that uh, that individualistic cultures are, are kind of represented more in the blue or the shades of blue and collectivistic in the red. And the stronger the color, then the stronger, the more they lean more toward that end of the spectrum or the other. Um, we can see that a lot of, you know, what we would call westernized cultures, meaning uh, cultures of Europe and certainly North America and then Australia and places like that are very um, individualistic, strongly individualistic uh, to, to in some instances. And then other parts of the country, other parts of the world are more collectivistic. And it's specifically kind of what we would call the older parts of the world, so to speak. So parts of the world where culture has kind of existed longer. And, and so, um, part of the reasoning for that is if we were to dip back into, you know, uh, McLuhan's theory of technological determinism, the people in the red parts of the world were kind of living there before lots of technology existed that allowed people to be apart from a group. So in, in, in those cultures, you developed a kind of this tribal mindset where you were really dependent on the tribe for survival. And so to communicate effectively within that tribe was critically important because if you weren't and you got kicked out, you'd be in real trouble in a really big hurry. Uh, so the, the mindset was, okay, what do we need to do as a group to coexist, to survive, to thrive together? As opposed to the parts where you see the kind of the quote unquote newer parts of the world, those westernized parts of the world, um, and in particular, you know, North America and Australia and places that were really um, settled much, much later than other parts of the, the world in terms of the, the contemporary societies that, that exist there now. Um, those are places that existed after technology existed where we could kind of spread out. So you see that pioneering spirit, you see that we're just going to hack it out of the woods and, and make it on our own. If we can't do it, then we just won't have it. Right. Um, that, that, that's that me first attitude that, that had to exist there. You wouldn't have those, those pioneers if you didn't have that attitude. 
Um, so while they were certainly neighborly and things, they, they really were very, very independent and relied on themselves. And it really sparked this sense of ingenuity too, that this entrepreneurism, this idea of, you know, I need a better way to harvest my crops. So let me create a combine, for example, uh, and uh, find a better way to do things. Let's build a better mousetrap so we can do things on our own and not have to depend on the tribe. And so, there, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, I'm really condensing all this very, very much, but it does kind of break down that way. If you see that this map of the world and you see this kind of the older parts of the world tend to be the darker red and the newer parts are the darker blue, the newer kind of the civilization of the society then the darker the blue and the older, the darker the red, uh, because they have that tribal mindset and still exists today, really. I mean, to a certain extent, not that, not that people live in tribes necessarily in those areas, but it's still that, that again, culture is learned and shared. And so those mindsets and those habits and those norms are passed down from generation to generation. Whereas in the bluer parts of the world, you get passed down, do it on your own, have some independence, go for it. If you want it, go get it. Do it on your own. Don't depend on other people. So, so you know, individualism and collectivism really kind of influence um, a lot of the rest of what we're going to be talking about here. In a sense that that uh, it, this is kind of a, a common theme throughout. That it's going to impact a lot of the other dimensions. Actually, this idea of individualism versus collectivism. So very very important to understand this one so that we can really understand the rest of them as well. But um, so individualism and collectivism start us on the ground floor here, really foundational uh, part of understanding the dimensions of culture and how it impacts communication then. Okay, so if we were to look at another dimension, then we could move to what we call high context versus low context, which specifically in, in low context cultures, um, people just kind of walk straight through. If we're looking at this graphic, the, the, the footprints that walk straight through that circle, those are low context cultures, meaning there's no beating around the bush. They just say what's on their mind. They go right to the point and don't mince words. And then uh, high context cultures are going to kind of tiptoe around things a little bit. Uh, again, we see this breakdown. Uh, individualistic cultures tend to be low context because they're more concerned with what do I need in this situation? What's important to me? Whereas collectivistic cultures are more concerned with how is this going to impact the other people? And that teaches them then to look at some things uh, maybe surrounding that communication, as opposed to just having the tunnel vision of a high, of a low context uh, communicator, right? And sometimes I think of it uh, and, and we'll sometimes describe it like looking through a keyhole, right? If you were to look at the scene through a keyhole, you would see just right what's right in front of you, right? You see that canoe, that's your focus point there, right? You're just seeing the canoe and the kind of the, the, the basic landscape around it, but not much really. You're seeing the water and the canoe. So this is really a picture of people in a canoe and that's pretty much it. Uh, and so that would be your understanding of that situation. That would be a low context con consideration of this, uh, of, of this situation because you're only seeing what's right in front of you, what's significant, what's what's immediately in front of you. Okay, you're not taking in the, the rest of the surroundings. Whereas in high context cultures, they're going to see the whole picture. They're not going to look through the keyhole. They're going to open the door and look at the entire landscape here and see that while, while there is a canoe and there's a body of water here, that is certainly not the only thing to look at here. There's beautiful mountain ranges and the forests and all kinds of stuff here to look at. They're going to see all the rest of this and see how that influences what else is happening in the picture, right? So in high context communication cultures, that's what they do. They don't just take people at their word. In low context communication cultures, you're just taking people basically at their word. This is what you said. So this is what you mean. And I'm just going to focus on that really. And that's pretty much it. We don't look for a lot of other things surrounding that. In high context communication cultures, they're going to consider things like, okay, this is what you said, but what does that really mean? And what do I, you know, what meaning does that really have in our culture? And then what do I know about you as a person, how you might use that phrase and what's our relationship like, and what's the temperature? What's, I mean, it's just all these things. They look at all these different things right? Because they're trying to keep that collectivistic, usually group harmony. And so they're, they're looking at those things as opposed to, again, the individualistic mindset of a low context, just straight ahead. This is what I need. This is what we're talking about. And so I'm going to take you at your word and assume this is what you mean. Um, so if we looked at, again, cultures that are high context versus low context, um, we see a, a lot of breakdown again in the older parts of the world. Those, if we were to lay this out on a map, it very much line up with that individualistic versus collectivistic map that we saw earlier. Um, you know, lots of Eastern Asian cultures and, uh, and just, you know, African cultures, even South American cultures tend to be 
uh, high context tend to take other things into consideration other than what's kind of in right in front of them or, or taking people literally at their word uh, and, and very uh, much the opposite end of that low context cultures um, are kind of the newer parts of the world so to speak right uh, and the, the, again this all exists on a spectrum uh, uh, and on a continuum really um, so it's not just you're either one or the other, but you're somewhere along that continuum. Every culture is so, um, but, but you know, we just, this is how it kind of breaks down in a sense, right? So some cultures are, are high context, some are low context. So another element of, uh, or another dimension of culture would be what we call power distance. And so you have high power distance and low power distance cultures. And in essence, that really has to do with kind of hierarchy and how strict is the hierarchy within that culture and the state of, are you able to move upward in that, um, in that hierarchy or in that culture, you're allowed to change your stripes, so to speak. So in some cultures, it's very set. You know, if we look at a very traditional Indian culture, for example, um, they have the caste system, which really keeps people locked in place. If you were born into this caste, then you are there forever, no matter, you know, what you might be able to achieve or whatever, um, you're going to be in that caste uh, for your entire life. Uh, and, and vice versa, if you're in the most powerful caste, no matter how how you know inept you are, you're going to be in that caste, no matter what, because that's what you were born into, as opposed to. A low power distance culture um, would be like the United States, where, where theoretically everybody is kind of on equal footing. doesn't matter who you are, what you do. You have the same kind of uh, authority, the same freedom. Everybody has the ability to kind of um, create their own um, future and 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 uh, pursue their goals. You know, that's this idea of anybody can be president in the United States. That's a very low power distance thing. And the idea that uh, when you are president, it doesn't make you any more special. You're still just a person. We respect the office, but but you're still just a person. It doesn't make that person any different. Or it doesn't make us. That's why we don't have to bow down to the the president or whatever. They're not, uh, you know, they don't have magical powers or anything like that. They're just they just happen to hold that office that we hold in high regard. Right? So a uh, very low power distance culture in the United States. Uh, another way to think of it is kind of like checkers and chess, where um, you know in chess you have very specific, very defined uh, role for every part, every piece, and they can't really change for the most part, right? That that uh, that uh, you know a queen has certain abilities and functions, and a knight has to move in certain ways, and and a pawn has to move in certain ways, and they can't really change that whereas in checkers every piece is the same now if you get far enough you can get you know you get the, the, the double there you get king then and, and you can uh, have special powers then but uh, but for the most part in checkers every piece is the same right they all move the same they all operate the same as opposed to chess where they have very distinct functions and, and abilities um, very high power distance uh, set up in um, chess, where you have, you know, it's unchanging versus low power distance and checkers, which is where it's all kind of the same in a flat structure. Again, and again, not surprisingly, we see that uh, it kind of divides in the same way this map does, as we saw in, originally in that uh, individualistic versus cultural uh, collectivistic map. Um, individualistic cultures tend to be highly, uh, ha very much have a low power distance mindset, whereas collectivistic cultures uh, tend to, again, kind of respect roles and respect um, uh, kind of their place, so to speak. And so you see more of a high power distance um, culture. It's not to say it's evil either, or bad either. That's why you see, you know, a lot of these cultures with high power distance, again, one of the attributes they have is they very much respect their elders uh, and care for their elders in a different way and in a much more respectful way than we do sometimes in low power distance cultures. So, if I, you know, for things like that, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different, but it is very different. If you're from uh, a place that holds the other view, then it may seem strange um, when you see people from the others. Uh, masculinity and feminine masculinity and femininity is another dimension of culture that's very important right so this is this idea of of, of uh, you know which kind of is favored and when we say that it's not strictly men are in charge or women are in charge uh it's more about what attributes do, do we value do we value 
uh, traits that we would normally associate with femininity, for example, like um, nurturing and caring and uh, those types of things, encouragement, those types of things. Or do we value the traits that would normally be associated with masculinity? So um, competitiveness and and um, and domination, so to speak, and you know those types of things. Uh, so we you know, a lot of chest thumping and going on in highly masculine societies. Yep. Uh, and that will define how a, a society kind of sees itself and, and operates culturally. Um, again, we see uh, uh, some variety here in terms of how these things exist throughout the world. But uh, the more red uh, an area is, then the more masculine it is in, in this uh, map. Um, so um, we see that uh, have varying degrees. But in, in places like Scandinavia, you have a higher degree of, of uh, femininity that is um, that is highly regarded um, there and in parts of Africa and, and South America more so than some of the other parts of the world. Uh, so that is something uh, to be uh, understood as well. Another dimension of culture is what is our comfort level with uncertainty? So how much are we looking to avoid uncertainty and how comfortable are we with uncertainty and ambiguity? Uh, sometimes they think of, we th think of this kind of as the Monty Hall um, problem, uh, meaning uh, Monty Hall was the host of a game show called um, Let's Make a Deal. Uh, and now it's Wayne Brady. So if you're more familiar with that version, but uh, originally it was Monty Hall, so it's called the Monty Hall problem. And part of this game was that, you know, he would give people prizes, people would win prizes, or he'd give them something, and he'd say, okay, now, you can either keep what you have now, or you can take what's behind door number one, or two, or three. And you could pick a door, or you could, uh, you know, he would offer you a door in exchange for what you have. So you have this known commodity, and what's behind the door could be much greater value, could be a, could be a new car, could be something of very little value, a wheelbarrow or a donkey or something, you know? Um, so you didn't know, you didn't know. And that's kind of where we're at in, as a culture, how comfortable are different cultures with uncertainty? You know, where are we at in terms of uh, how, how much we trying to avoid uncertainty and how okay are we with just saying, okay, I don't know for sure. And, and we'll go with that. We'll, we'll, you know, how much of things have to be a known commodity. So uh, there, again, some cultures that really just are okay with this and other cultures that are not. And so we, we, you know, some cultures need to, to know things. And so um, you see this divided again, different parts of the world. Um, the more, um, uh, the, the darker the color of, uh, in this map, then the more they will try and avoid uncertainty, meaning the more they want certainty and uh, do and don't care for uncertainty, uh, as opposed to the lighter colors are more tolerant of uncertainty and kind of, you know, going with the flow and, and not knowing exactly what's happening. Not just to, like when we encounter things, but when we come across people who are different than us? How do we deal with that? You know, uh, has to do with how um, uh, homogenous or or uh, or heterogeneous uh, uh, society is, right? Um, so, um, for example, the United States is pretty diverse. I mean, there's a lot of diversity in the United States, so we run across people quite a bit who are from different cultures and hold different views than us, and so uh, so we are fairly uh, tolerant, relatively speaking. We are more tolerant than than a lot of other cultures um, when it comes to uncertainty just because we're so used to not knowing exactly who we're going to run into, who we're going to be dealing with and that kind of thing, as opposed to cultures where you have, uh, where, that are very homogenous, that are very much the same, um, then, then those cultures are uh, going to, um, not be as, un not be as comfortable with uncertainty because they're used to knowing what they're getting and knowing who they're dealing with and, and having everybody kind of be the same. And there's not a lot of diversity within that culture or diversity in the ways of, of thinking. So they tend to be less comfortable with uh, uncertainty. So, but that's another dimension to keep in mind, another significant factor uh, and influence uh, from culture in communication. Uh, then finally, the last one we want to look at is pers your perspective on time. Right. And just how do you view time? Um, and we kind of divide this typically in what we call monochronic versus polychronic cultures, meaning monochronic cultures are very much focused on time, very much geared toward time. Everything is very, you know, 
So monochronic cultures, for example, when a meeting and you say you're supposed to be somewhere at three o'clock, boy, you better be there at three o'clock. And that meeting will start at three o'clock and it will end on time. It will end at four o'clock. And, uh, and if I was teaching a class, for example, and it's, it's supposed to be from three to four, right? And if that class went to 401, students would be revolting. Right. They would be up in arms saying this class is over. I can't believe we're going over time. Right. Because we're very much on a, in a monochronic society. Uh, we get that expression. Time is money because time is a commodified thing. It is important. to So we, we calculate it very carefully and it's very much a linear thing. It exists on this clock and on this calendar in a broader sense. Right. And it's very linear. It's very, very set. Right? As opposed to polychronic cultures, which where time is a little more it oozes a little more, right? It's not as time is a ribbon and not a, a line straight line there in polychronic cultures. A lot of times, right? They have this different viewpoint of, of time. And, it, and, and again, it's not right or wrong. It sounds really weird. If you're from a monochronic society to say, well, if a meeting starts at three, then people, you know, people will show up around then, but it may or may not start at three and it may go a little longer or shorter. Who knows? It's just kind of but there are other things that are more important than time. And so we're not going to be commodified by time or ruled by time, so to speak, in, in a polychronic society. And there's really something to be said for that um, in a sense of in terms of, you know, less heart attacks, I'm sure, and things less stress on people. But, uh, but uh, you know, so, so what's our view on time? And so we see, again, in different parts of the world, different perspectives on time. Um, the more um, uh, the more green you have, uh, it's more monochronic as opposed to others are more polychronic. Right. Um, so um, just a, just a different perspective on uh, how we use time and how we how we view time and and how we regard time and just our perspective on time in general. Okay, so this is just a this is just a quick overview on some of the different dimensions of culture and the ways that they influence communication. Again, really a lot of it grounded in that individualist um, versus collectivist mindset. Not all of it, but a lot of it uh, comes right down to that in terms of what do we put first in a you know in a monochronic society it tends to be largely individualistic because then my time is important. What I'm doing is important and I need to be somewhere else. And I'm not as concerned about what you're doing, but what I have, I'm on the schedule and I need to focus on that. In a collectivistic society, you tend to be more forgiving. You tend to be more, and again, flexible with that kind of thing, understanding that, you know, it's not worth upsetting the fruit cart, so to speak, to, uh, to cause, you know, ripples. You don't want to make waves and cause ripples in the pond uh, by upsetting people just because you're on a different, uh, a little bit of time, you know, what's the different, what's it matter to allow somebody a little time if it's going to keep the peace, right? Um, so again, all this influence, heavy influence on, on communication and the way we communicate. So uh, just understanding these dimensions of culture is incredibly important. And, you know, we, we try and have a, a multi-dimensional perspective on the world, right? It's good to see things just in the world in, uh, in different dimension with with a deeper dimension and so we want the same thing for culture we want to understand that culture has these multiple dimensions and, uh, and that we need to appreciate that in other cultures and be prepared to uh, understand that and incorporate that into the way that we communicate with people then interculturally if you have questions about the dimensions of culture and and how they impact communication and, and what that intersection is between culture and communication and any of that please feel free to email me i'd love to hear from you there in the meantime i hope that this has been enlightening for you and that it gives you a better understanding of what we mean when we talk about that intersection uh, between culture and communication and why the impact of that certainly is uh, is is incredibly uh, important as we study intercultural communication